minutes. And initially it felt like a burning sensation. Live from London, this is Piers Morgan Uncensored. Well, good evening, London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Tonight, a dramatic and exclusive interview with one of the most explosive figures in global politics. He's the world-class sportsman who became a world leader. And just five days ago, he cheated death in Rang Khan. He's known across the planet as a legendary cricketer. He's captain of Pakistan. He was a nation's hero before sensationally becoming his prime minister. Earlier this year, he was ousted from power in what he insists was a conspiracy. And last week, rallying supporters for a march on the capital and a stunning political comeback, this happened. Well, that gun attack on his convoy killed one person and injured at least 10 more. A suspect was arrested after a supporter overpowered him. Tonight, for the first time on UK television, Imran Khan tells the full dramatic story of surviving his assassination attempt. In slow motion, I felt, and I honestly, even when I was lying there with these three bullets, I felt I'd been saved. He reveals his fiery views on the plot to kill him. The more my party got popular, the more we sort of swept the by-elections, the more danger to my life. His chilling fears for the future. People are so worried. My, in my country, I've, uh, right now, I've never had this feeling before because they know that the guys who missed this time will try again. And his verdict on Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and racism in the UK. I never thought that a day would come and uh, Britain would be ready for an Indian origin Prime Minister. Mm. It's a remarkable interview. We cover lots of ground. And I began with a very sincere and heartfelt message. Well, I'm joined now by Imran Khan. Imran, great to see you. And it really is great to see you. Um, how are you? It's my first question. Recovering, uh, Piers. Uh, I've got, had three bullets taken out from my right leg and some shrapnel on my left leg. So uh, one of the bullets uh, has uh, fractured my shin bone. So that's, that would take a bit of time. But I'm recovering. Glad that uh, it could have been a lot worse. You know, uh, it was back in June that we spoke and I asked you directly about how you felt about the threat of assassination. You were aware of a plot then to try and kill you. When I entered politics, I actually had conquered my fear of dying. But when that moment happens, when you start to hear gunfire, what on earth was that like for you? Do you know, uh, first it sounded like uh, firecrackers. And then, you know, my right leg uh, buckled under me because it, it, it was hit by these bullets. And initially it felt like a burning sensation. And as I was falling, there was another, there were two shooters. One was on the left side and he would have got me on the top body, but he was only 20 feet away. So this uh, very brave person in the crowd went after him and and went for the gun, so the gun went down, uh, uh, you know, this uh, pistol which was on automatic, and when it went down, it hit my leg. So when I fell, th there was another shooter in front, and when he fired, the bullets went over me. So as I was falling, these bullets were going over me. Only you, Imran, could be slightly smiling as you tell this story. I mean, to me, this sounds utterly horrifying. This is two people trying to kill you. Uh, it was a plot. Look, uh, Piers, I told you when I spoke to you in June that there was this plot. Uh, why did they want to kill me? Because when the whole conspiracy to change my government and, uh, and this regime changed, uh, they expected that the party would just wither away or it'll take years for it to recover. In fact, what happened was that unprecedented public reaction and you had uh, millions of people coming on the streets the next day to protest against the regime change. So I think from then onwards, what they expected was that my popularity or my party would go down. In fact, it went up. That's when my life became, uh, came in danger. So there was a first plot, four people uh, decided to bump me off. I, I, I found out because remember, I was head of the intelligence agencies for three and a half years when I was the prime minister. 
So I, uh, I named those people in a video and announced that if anything happens to me, these four people would be exposed. They're powerful people. And then because of that, it protected me. But then the party became even stronger. 75% of all by-elections were swept by my party uh, against all the parties put together. So 11 parties on one ticket and my party on, and we, we got 75% of the election. So that's when the second plot came in. Now this plot was to have me bumped off by a religious fanatic and it would be that I had committed blasphemy. So this plot started uh, in September I, I, and I found out and again how I find out is from within the intelligence agencies because people are appalled by what is going on here. So they, uh, they uh, I found out, I again went on the media, uh, on public rallies, two public rallies on 24th of September and 7th of October and said that they will, they are preparing the grounds uh, and it was a media uh, first which prepared the ground and I know who was behind it. And then they would have some, exactly what happened to me, someone would claim I'm a religious fanatic, he's offended my uh, 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 sensitivities about religion and he would shoot me. So this was again, it's on record. Uh, the whole script I, I announced in a public, two public rallies. Uh, and that's what happened. That's what they did. Imran, notwithstanding the fact that you, you had these threats on your life, to actually go out and face big crowds week in, week out, month in, month out. You know, I know you from your past as a fearless cricketer. This is a whole different world, thinking that somebody may be there wanting to take your life. How did you deal with that? How did it make you feel? There's, uh, when they imposed this a government of crooks and let me tell you the whole country knows it's a government of two families who've been stealing money from this country who've been in jail their books written on their corruption i came into politics to fight these two families so when they brought them back through a conspiracy and imposed them on us i decided that i was not going to sit at home and that's when i went out in the public and for six months i was campaigning now during these six months frequently i would get this message that you know there's going to be a bomb blast or your suicide attacker or your life is at threat and so I took a conscious decision do I accept uh, these crooks to rule over us just because I'm my life is at threat or should I believe as I believe in God as a Muslim that uh, life and death is in his hands so I, I took a decision I said look whatever happens I know that there's these uh, big guns are threatened this uh, uh, what should I say? Mafias are threatened. If I and the more my party got popular, the more we sort of swept the by-elections, the more danger to my life. Now, when the first plot, uh, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the second plot was, um, you know, I I knew I as I said in a, in a public rally I spoke about it. Now, as I was falling, when the bullets hit my leg and I fell and these bullets went over my head. And I, then I felt my body, because when, I was, when the shooting stopped, I felt sort of where, and I felt my leg was hit, it was numb. But I checked my top body. Then I realized that the Almighty had saved me. Because there's no way I should have been saved, because there were two shooters, one very close, 20 feet, the other one right in the building in front. There's no way I should have survived it. But you know, that it reinforced my faith in, in the Almighty. I mean, it was an astonishing escape. You know, by all, you know, if you look at the footage, you just assume that in that scenario, your chances of survival are very small. You know, Piers, this guy, I mean, the hero, there are two heroes that, uh, that, uh, that saved me. One was this, this guy, when he saw him taking this pistol out, this guy immediately went for his hand. And, you know, when he... Uh, when he tried to grab the gun, the gun went down and that's how I, I was saved because I would have got all the bullets on my top body. So they went at my legs and then, you know, uh, this other guy also tried to, he had two magazines still. So if this guy hadn't intervened, the guy would have fixed two magazines and, and kept shooting. And then, you know, when the other guy hit, hit us, because it hit my leg, I collapsed. So the bullets went over my head. I, in slow motion, I felt and I honestly, even when I was lying there with these three bullets, I felt I'd been saved. I mean, truly remarkable. The, the first uh, guy who, who raced to your rescue, who you can see in the pictures, pushing the shooter's gun up, 
Um, and then the second guy you see trying to run towards him, then he, as he pushes him away, he falls over and very sadly, it transpires he lost his life. This man really gave his life to save you. How do you feel about him? He had come to this rally with his two kids. Uh, uh, and, and so he, with two kids there, he went for the gunman who shot him in the face. Now that was really tragic. I mean, that really touched not just me, the whole of the country. Because there was this picture of him lying dead and these two, his kids sitting either side trying to wake him up. You know, it, it was, uh, I think that was uh, uh, probably the most uh, awful sight I've seen. So I called his family, I saw, met his kids, and we have decided to take care of them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a very honourable thing to do. Remarkable courage they showed. Um, you also, Imran, you have kids back here in the UK, and your ex-wife Jemima was on Twitter saying how relieved that they all were uh, to see that you'd survived this. But, you know, in those moments, you must also... You're a father. You know, you, what were your thoughts once you knew you'd survived about your sons? Did you, did you want to speak to them quickly? Because obviously they would, they would hear about it perhaps before you could even talk to them. I did. I, well, you know, I, had, I was driven from there. It almost took me two hours to get to the hospital which I built, you know, which is the, the best, for, for, for me, the best hospital in Pakistan because three times I've been treated there and I'm quite scared of needles and stuff like that. So I went to the hospital, two hours drive. The moment I got there, then I spoke to my sons. Uh, and of course, I spoke to my wife, uh, both of them. My wife actually was uh, remarkable, you know, she was almost, she was, you know, the fact that I was saved, she was quite relieved. But my boys were sort of quite worried, and I hope to see them soon. I mean, are they keen for you now to stay out of the public eye? I've got three sons in their 20s. I would imagine if something similar happened to me, the first thing they would want is an assurance from their father that I wouldn't be putting myself over the parapet. I know you, and I know how committed you are to this. I'm sure you want to continue. But is that, is that on your mind, your sons, and how they feel? Well, my sons, when they were younger, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I'm talking about my older son was very sensitive. So when I, when they were about eight, nine years old, my older son, that's when he used to worry a lot, you know. And he always uh, wanted me out of politics. But you know, I, you know, I feel that you know we human beings uh, have a responsibility to our society, and this is the spiritual way of life. There are two ways: one is material yourself, the other is the spiritual. And some 30 years ago, when I went on the spiritual path, that's the only reason I came into politics, because I realized I had a responsibility being so privileged in this country. So therefore, uh, you have to have faith. And faith is in God. And the one verse in the Quran, that un it's when the, when the Almighty decides, it's not one minute before or one, one minute after. That's your time. So when I was lying on that, uh, you know, with these bullets, I knew I'd been saved. So it's so easy, you know, and repairs. I've sat in a cancer hospital. I built this hospital for five years. I, my office was there. I saw healthy people coming and going in six months or, or some being saved. So life and death, I feel, you know, we worry too much that uh, we have control over it. We don't. It's in, uh, in Almighty's hands. What is going to be your response, Imran? Are you just going to continue putting yourself out there, going back on protest marches, continuing to fight your cause? Will nothing change? Well, no, the moment my leg heals, I'm, I'm going to be out again. But, uh, you know, people are so worried. My, in my country, I've, uh, right now, I've never had this feeling before because they know that the guys who missed this time will try again. The public in Pakistan knows this because these are powerful people. And uh, they also are worried that if now, if whenever there are elections, my party is going to sweep the elections. All opinion polls, polls, surveys, all these by-elections, they reflect that my party now is the most popular party in Pakistan. So because of this threat and worried if I win, uh, they, they are going to try again. We all know it. So I've doubled my security at my house. I mean, you are a remarkably phlegmatic character, Imran. And again, I go back to when I watched you play cricket and you faced the fastest bowlers probably the world has ever seen. And you did it with swashbuckling panache and, and audacity and courage. 
But it's one thing facing fast bowlers in a cricket match, quite another going back out after people have tried to shoot you dead and know that they may try again. Uh, where are you getting this strength of character from? Uh, there's faith. I have, uh, you know, I never really had faith in my life till much later at the end of my cricketing career. And the, it's very clear there are two ways of spending your life. One is, you know, where you're conscious, uh, uh, the spiritual life, which is that there is a purpose to existence and how, how much the Almighty gives you, the more responsibility He puts on you. So that's one way. And the other is living for yourself, which is very easy. I mean, even from after cricket, I never had to work after that. I could easily live a very comfortable life. So it was a conscious decision some 30 years ago. You're very passionate about who you think uh, ordered this and executed it. But who do you trust in Pakistan to properly, impartially investigate this? Well, uh, let me tell you that in the institution of the army, people are extremely upset what has happened. So it's not as if the whole institution is involved, you know, this. I believe that this in intelligence officer, I know there are two accomplices. And remember, the, the, the intelligence services are under the prime minister. So there's the prime minister and the interior minister. So the only hope I have is that if uh, the chief justice of Pakistan, if he asserts himself, if he takes, if he now has this inquiry conducted through the Supreme Court, you know, gets uh, the people involved of, of, of repute. Already there's a case. There's a, there was the best investigative journalist in Pakistan, Arshad Sharif. He was my, you know, he was talking about this regime change and he was always uh, uh, backing my point of view. He was the number one journalist. He was hounded out of Pakistan. The same intelligence officers were involved. He was threatened. He left Pakistan for Dubai. He went to Kenya. He was assassinated in Kenya. And as for the shooters, one of them we know was arrested. Uh, the second one that you claim was shooting has not been arrested. What do you think happened to that second shooter? I think the second shooter is at large. Uh, you know, it's not just me. I mean, I, these bullets, because this shooter was on the left. The bullets that were going over my head and others, and in fact, there were eyewitnesses who, who saw it, him firing from a building. So uh, he, we have no idea. And the police hasn't registered a case against the other one. They've only blamed this. So because this shooter fits in with the, with the narrative that it was a religious fanatic. By the way, he's not a religious fanatic because the social media guys went to his, his home and, and discovered this guy didn't even pray. So, but he was a very professional shooter. You know, he shot with this automatic. If you, I have done pistol shooting and if you shoot uh, it on automatic, it's very difficult unless you're used to it to control it because it goes up. But he had complete control, so he was a trained guy. And the other one, I, we, we, you know, we are hundred percent sure that he was the one who was the rail. Uh, you know, who would have been the. But if I, if I had, uh, if he missed me, he would have got me. Remarkable stuff from Imran Khan, and part two will be after the break. Well, welcome back. In my second half of my exclusive interview with Imran Khan, we talk about British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and what the first Hindu British PM says about modern Britain. And a warning, there's some strong language here. One of the other major issues right now is free speech. We've got Elon Musk has bought Twitter and is determined, as he says, to bring back free speech. We've also seen in August uh, the author Salman Rushdie uh, attacked on stage and nearly murdered, suffered uh, horrific injuries. Uh, obviously, that is a, a controversial subject in Pakistan, Salman Rushdie and his book, Satanic Verses. What is your reaction to what happened to Salman Rushdie? I've already uh, given my reaction, uh, Piers. As you quite rightly have pointed out, it, it is, a, uh, especially in our country, it's extremely controversial. I mean, is it so controversial you don't want to say anything? Uh, you know, I have enough issues right now to uh, to deal with rather than, uh, you know, have other issues on my head. I mean, I, I hear you and I understand it, but there were a lot of people who obviously would have felt that free speech should mean free speech, that what happened to Salman Rushdie was a consequence of a, a, a fatwa being put on him and somebody then executing <coughs> that fatwa. 
Uh, Piers, look, you know, I've commented on that issue and uh, there was a big uh, backlash because people don't understand this and I'm talking about where I'm sitting right now. So where you are from, I understand your point of view, but where I am, uh, you know, it, it is just going to cause, uh, as it did before when, when I commented on it. So uh, let me just pass on this. I mean, just as a final observation, you mean that it would put your life in even more danger should you continue to comment on it? <laughs> Look, I have enough challenges already. I understand. Let me ask you about the US midterm elections, which have just taken place. Uh, unusually, and well, I think surprisingly, the Democrats and Joe Biden didn't get the heavy losses that they were anticipating and that everybody else was anticipating. Uh, what does that tell you about the state of American politics? What is your view now of the Biden administration? I know that you blame them for what happened to you earlier this year. Do you hope to have a better relationship with them going forward? Look, Bez, you look. Who would not want to have good relationship with the United States? It's a superpower. And from Pakistan's point of view, our, we export the our highest exports are to the US. And the most powerful and the richest Pakistani expatriate community are the Pakistani American uh, 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 in the US. So, uh, we, uh, you know, it's unthinkable that you would not want to have good relationship with the US. There's only one issue I have, you know, Pakistan and U.S. relationship has been like a transactional master-slave relationship when Pakistan is needed, you know, we serve a purpose and then, uh, and we degrade ourselves. By the way, I don't blame the U.S. that much. I think we allow ourselves to be used like a tissue paper. And it's humiliating as a Pakistani that, you know, we, were th we got independence at the same time as India. India has, you know, a very dignified relationship with the U.S. You know, they, every country wants to protect its interests. India stands for its interests. But what Pakistan has done is we've been like slaves. We've been used, like for instance, the war on terror. Pakistan had nothing to do with 9-11. With we were, the, uh, the head of the, uh, our state claimed that they were forced into this war by the US because the US would bomb us into Stone Age. We ended up losing 80,000 Pakistanis in a war that had nothing to do with us. So that's what I object to. I want a relationship like India has with the US. We have in the UK now the first uh, prime minister who's come from an Asian background, uh, Indian heritage, Rishi Sunak. Uh, you spent a lot of time in the UK. Were you, were you surprised by that? Were you pleasantly surprised that we've finally gone for a non-white prime minister? I am, uh, I, I, I am surprised. Because, you know, my, what I had, you know, and I remember I went there as an 18 year old and then there were these skinheads around and they would beat up anyone Asian. They would beat them up and call them Pakis. So I saw that, uh, you know, the beginning and racism was very obvious at that time. As a cricketer, as a young cricketer, I, I used to see, feel racism in county cricket. But when I became faster and a fast bowler, then of course, uh, if there was racism, it was behind my back. It wasn't on the cricket field. But in the in the beginning, I would, uh, there would be racist comments on right on your face. Uh, but I saw the change take place. But I must confess, I never thought that a day would come and uh, Britain would be ready for an Indian origin prime minister. And I think it's very positive. You know, he's a massive cricket fan. He goes and has nets at the Oval. Um, he, and I, I said, are you a defensive batsman? He went, absolutely not, front foot very much in the Imran Khan category of batsman by the sound of it. Um, is, are you comforted that we have a leader in this country who's a cricket fan? I would think they're on a different level of human being, superior. Uh, uh, look, it's uh, Britain, I mean, uh, whoever becomes the prime minister right now, you know, he has to have the ability to take pressure because it's going through, uh, uh, I feel, uh, probably one of the, I mean, ever since I've, uh, you know, been in touch with Britain. 70s, there were these coal miner strikes and, and so on strikes. But since then, I think this is probably the toughest time uh, the country is going through. So it's not going to be easy. He, he needs to be, it'll be a baptism of fire for uh, Rishi Sunak. Yeah. Do you know, have you met him? No, no, I've never met him. Would you like to? Yes, one day. Uh, uh, yes, I would. 
I want to end on a positive note, Imran. It's been a riveting interview, as always, with you, but particularly given what happened to you. Um, the T20 World Cup, literally moments before I sat down for this interview, Pakistan had a fantastic win over New Zealand and have roared into the T20 final, where they may end up playing England. Yeah, a repeat of uh, 92 World Cup, because we beat New Zealand in the semi-finals and then we played England in the final. Uh, yes, it's a, a country celebrating right now. Uh, it's, a, it's, as you say, it's not been easy, uh, probably not even in England, but it's not been easy here. And this win has given all of us a great boost. So we are all looking forward to the final. And I think our team looks good. I'm, I think we, we might just win the final. Well, let's not be too Inshallah. hasty here, Imran, I'm sorry. But our boys are coming for you. And just to remind you, we also recently won another World Cup. So we've got a bit of, bit of trophy in the cabinet. Mm. It's fantastic to see you. I really, I started that way and I really mean it. And when I first heard about what had happened, you always fear the absolute worst and my heart sunk, particularly given the conversation we'd had just a few months ago. Uh, so it's mm. great to see you alive and well. And